so I am going to provide an overview of the Polar Data Planning Summit that was held uh, last week from the 22nd to 24th of uh, May in Boulder, Colorado. As I said, there are a few people uh, online here who uh, attended that, so if you want to add or make additional comments, please feel free to do so. Um, I'm just going to try and give a, a very high-level overview. Um, this is actually not the whole list of all the participants, but this is a list of people who originally um, started the process about a year ago, uh, putting together the proposal and the, and the grant and so on, and there are quite a few others who have joined since then who participated um, in, in the um, activity. So the general objective of the Polar Data Planning Summit was to bring together um, particularly organizations who are active in um, polar data management, uh, data centers, um, other types of data collection organizations who are interested in um, connecting globally. So looking at how we can um, you know, increase our collaboration, um, increase efficiency, uh, work together on standards, um, and things like that. Uh, and there are quite a few different organizations who are working in this space now, particularly in the Arctic. Um, so we thought it was good to sort of get together. And a, another priority for the summit was to really start to focus on some hands-on activities. So not just to sort of share information and all of that, but to actually be doing some, some technical work. And that came from previous meetings. Um, so we did have two tracks uh, at the summit. And one was a technical track and the other was looking at sort of the context or sort of the bigger picture issues. Um, so I'm going to very quickly go through the technical track and some of the discussions that were had there. And um, perhaps after the presentation, if there are questions, we have a, a couple of people who are in that track uh, with us and they can answer some of the specifics. But um, generally in the technical track, we were building on existing work. So we've had a number of workshops over the last decade in particular, where we tried to identify various issues. So before going into the technical discussions, um, we, tr we tried to identify some key, key priority issues to discuss and particularly interoperability. And we divided that into data interoperability, metadata interoperability. And then we also had a, uh, some discussion on some of the new emerging uh, web, web platforms um, and uh, that type of thing. So, and if I could just again ask um, if people are coming on, if you could just mute yourselves, or Meredith, if you can um, try to mute people. I'm just getting a little little bit of background noise coming in. So, um, so yeah, we're trying to build on these these existing meetings uh, and and establish some focus on our discussions, uh, which we did. So we started with. Um, an overview, we did. We had a, some talks, there were, were not many talks, but we had a few talks just to sort of seed the conversation and those we, we selected a few key platforms or key data infrastructures um, that are out there that are operational um, or just about to become operational and we had some discussions about uh, what those, those look like and some of the, the issues um, that they're uh, dealing with and some of the interfaces and data resources that they have. Um, so this was by no means comprehensive. There were far more than, than we could talk about, uh, but these were just to give a sense of some of the, the variety of different things that are out there. Um, we also started on day one in just some higher level conversations about um, larger global initiatives, some, uh, like the FAIR initiative that looks at trying to establish FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data, and also highlighted um, some of the other um, issues that are being discussed in the Arctic in particular uh, around indigenous knowledge and so on. So the working session uh, started on the second day. The first day was a half day, so it was just the afternoon of uh, the 22nd. Uh, on the second day, we moved into to a working session. So pretty much the entire day was just hands-on breakout groups where we had uh, the technical track. Um, on the first day, we presented on a couple of what we call use cases just to help guide the discussion. So if we got to a point where people were saying, okay, we want to ground this a bit in some real world um, use cases or real world scenarios, um, what might we think about? So the two that were presented, one was focused on um, biology and marine resource management, both in the Arctic and the Antarctic, and the other was on looking at extreme cryospheric events. Um, and uh, again, that's relevant to both the Arctic and Antarctic, but particularly relevant for the Arctic. 
Um, so some background work was done before the summit with a number of domain experts to put together some questions and some plausible cases, and one of them actually is through IARPIC. Um, so there's an initiative just getting started fo focused on the Bering, um, Bering Strait that's looking at bringing together data for a number of different uh, scientific and community priorities. So that was some background. Um, the participants were given a template, uh, and the aim was to sort of ask them as experts in the field, you know, how would they fill in this? If they're looking at the bottom level here is to try and identify either data or metadata uh, stores, whether those be catalogs or, or data resources, et cetera. Um, are there particular tools or middleware in the middle of the mediators, so things that are actually processing data that could be identified? and then um, particular user interfaces, so portals and, and um, spaces where people will actually get access to the data. And wherever possible, the request was to identify particular user and user types that would be using um, various infrastructure and different levels. Um, so there was a lot, a lot actually came out of it. Uh, I've, I've sort of uh, deliberately blurred the results here because they're not quite ready for release. <laughs> so don't, don't put on your glasses. Um, what, what quickly happened was as the group discussed the, the various issues, uh, there was general agreement that, you know, the data interoperability is a, is a huge issue, but it's not something that they felt they could make a lot of progress on in a day. And they were feeling that we're much closer in terms of bringing together various discovery tools, you know, catalogs, metadata, and so on, and that they would focus on that, which in turn for a future session would allow people to be able to access um, data and give us better accessibility to the data. Um, so what is evolving now, and this will be put together in a white paper or some other publication that comes out of the summit, is a... Um, a pretty large inventory of various catalogs and uh, metadata resources, you know, discovery resources, um, with details about those resources. So whether or not they have interoperable service endpoints on them, um, you know, there's different protocols and standards, but the one, you know, some of the specific ones we're looking at are things like uh, Open Search um, and Catalog Services for Web, which is an OGC protocol. Uh, and some others. And the conclusion was that there a relatively small number of these services could actually connect to the vast majority of the, um, of the resources out there. Um, so a lot of discussion was put towards, you know, filling in these blanks, but then as they were going through and working on this, as the group worked through it, they also came up with a, a, a number of recommendations. And some of them are fairly specific to the polar community. And other ones are just, I think, referencing broader recommendations on things like establishing persistent identifiers and, and things like that. So that will be included in the white paper as well. It'll be the specific sort of mappings and the database of, of different um, portals and catalogs. And then there'll be some more general uh, recommendations and, and commentary. So a lot of, uh, actually a huge amount of work was done in a day. We had about probably close to 20 people um, working together on it um, with shared documents and so on. So they got a lot done in a, in a very short period of time. Um, we also had a track that is looking at, that looked at um, context and organizational challenges. So that's sort of bigger picture. Um, you know, one of the key things that we're all working in, particular in the Arctic, less so in the Antarctic, is just the large number of organizations um, and different resources and trying to um, not only identify what those are, but also um, try and establish some sort of way forward uh, in terms of, of coordination and alignment and, and so on. Um, so we had a demonstration on the first day of an uh, initiative called Mapping the Arctic Data Ecosystem, where we actually have a tool now where we're putting together a database that allows you to start to uh, visualize the community, um, the ecosystem, and also to query, so we can sort of start to filter down and ask questions, and that's going to be updated with a lot of the materials from the, uh, from the technical track, as well as a, a bunch of other data that's already waiting to go into that. Um, I'm just going to go really, really high level here uh, for the summary of topics. I went through the notes today and there are many, many pages of notes from that track that need to be distilled and I'm working on that with, with the group. But um, 
you know, we recognize this is goes well beyond a, a technical endeavor that's strictly about, you know, data and technology. Um, there's also things like organizational relationships, you know, standards, policy, international relations factor into it at some level. Um, we're dealing with local to global scales, et cetera. And so some of the big questions we were talking about is, you know, how do you in, influence the sort of the emerging system in a purposeful way? So keep us moving in a, a direction that has been, I think, more or less identified as for priorities over the, the past decade or so in terms of the types of things that, that we're trying to achieve. And I've gone over those in, in previous um, presentations in this meeting and others. Um, we recognize the need for sort of top down and bottom up activities and structures. Um, you know, this came in the general idea of governance, although that was a, a challenging term to use because in, in this space, it's it's difficult sometimes to use the term governance because we're not always dealing with what people think of as governance and so on. So a lot of the discussion was around that, sort of unpacking these ideas of, you know, what's governance, what's organization, coordination, et cetera, and also important, the who. So, you know, when you're talking about governance, you know, there are many, many different actors in this space, and how do we ensure that all of the appropriate actors are around that governance table? And that's something I think we still have a challenge with, particularly in, in terms of in the Arctic with engaging with uh, indigenous organizations and, and indigenous communities, et cetera, and, and some others. Um, something that came up that's a difficult one, but something that we all felt was fairly practical is that we have a lot of actors. We have a lot of different organizations, initiatives, and so on. So is there a way that we can not necessarily uh, eliminate, although that, that's one possibility, is simplify the actor space. And so again, this is part of the, the governance discussion and I think what we're starting to see happen uh, organically, but is, you know, to what extent do we need to start putting a bit of design into that. Um, and something that actually Sandy brought out in the meeting was just always remembering, you know, and confirming the why of what we're doing and then getting into the what and the how and so on rather than, than the other way around. So that helped to sort of guide our discussions where we're trying to formulate the, you know, the drivers for you know, data, data interoperability and so on and all the work that we do. Um, in terms of next steps, uh, we have many that are possible. And again, that's all getting put together uh, in the reporting. Um, but I think one that really came out in terms of a priority and when asking people, you know, whether they felt the, the meeting was useful and, and productive was this idea of, you know, collaboration and coordination. So we've already done that. We've, we've had many for, for many, many years that's been happening. Um, so these are just some examples of past meetings where we had, you know, polar data forum meetings and various committee meetings and so on. Um, what really stuck, stuck out here, I think, was particularly with the technical track, um, people said they found it productive because they were able to, they were given the chance or the platform to actually sit down and get some work done and really get into the details. Um, so moving forward, we talked about this idea as of trying to do this in a more sustainable, more sustained and organized way. So uh, particularly we're looking at this idea of maybe regular, but not necessarily frequent, probably not frequent high level meetings. So those would be more sort of strategic envisioning meetings that could happen anywhere from two to five year cycles. Um, and we were sort of leaning more towards uh, a five year cycle where the community gets together and you know looks at the, the big issues, questions, priorities, and so on. Um, but then that would be coupled with quite frequent working meetings. Um, so in this, could take advantage of existing groups and meetings like the Research Data Alliance, for example, happens every six months. Um, we did that last year where the three of the polar data groups got together just for two days before the RDA meeting and then went to the RDA meeting for broader collaboration, so something along that. Uh, and then also sort of keeping various focused working groups moving. So I'll talk about that in a, a couple of slides after this one. Um, but of course, all of this takes effort, it takes time, it takes resources, um, if nothing else, you know, travel resources help, et cetera. Um, so establishing ongoing resources is critical, and I think we set as a priority for at least some in the community would be on trying to develop and raise resources we talked about from some very specific mechanisms um, to do that. 
Uh, some of the working groups I mentioned, so there's one uh, that's been formed already that's looking at data discovery and federated search. So many people from that group were at the meeting last week and, and thus I think it was leaning more towards um, federated search and bringing the catalogs together. Uh, and so a lot of work's being done here initially to, to set these inventories of what's out there and then uh, they're going to be getting into more of the uh, actual applied stuff like you know if we want to set up you know single window catalogs and things like that for particular communities what are the tools that people might use and so on um, so that's been a very active group over about the last eight months or so since it was formed and there are already um, a number of materials that will be published i think within the next few months coming out of that group that will then also reference you know, larger initiatives like the RDA and, and other standards bodies and things like that. Uh, there's a semantics group that's looking at vocabularies and semantics, so that's getting started as well. At the moment, that's mostly people just trying to connect um, who are doing semantics and vocabulary work, which are part of the same thing really, but we do break those out into specifics. Um, in the polar regions so that we can get a sense of what people are doing and try and you know increase efficiency and avoid duplication and so on and that of course links to, to federated search and things like that because there are things like keywords but it also goes well beyond that into the data interoperability so um, a lot is happening within the indigenous um, uh, community space as well uh, a number of indigenous organizations are taking leadership in this area and there's some also university-based projects that are doing a lot of work. So, you know, we're seeing this happen in a number of different areas and we're starting to see some really good connection uh, between these efforts as well. Um, so upcoming opportunities, I'm just gonna wrap up here with this. Uh, what we agreed to as well was that we should be looking for opportunistic ways to get together and keep this, keep this um, movement going or keep the activity going. Uh, many people are going to be attending the Polar 2018 meetings in Davos, Switzerland, uh, towards the end of June. Uh, so there's already the Standing Committee on Antarctic Data Management is having a meeting uh, from the uh, 15th to the 17th there, and the Arctic Data Committee is going to sit in on the 16th. And so there's and there's a working group for the Polar Working Group already established for morning there. Um, Geocold Regions is having um, a thing. I'm going to go through this in my next presentation, but um, there are a number of groups meeting there. So we've agreed to try and keep things going there. And then there are some additional meetings coming up later in the year. So as a starting point, we just want to identify those and, and keep things going that way. We also talked about uh, things like um, online hackathons and potentially organizing something like that. So the results will be better formed uh, in a few weeks time when we're in Davos. So we'll be sharing um, some of at least the original or initial summary results uh, at the Polar 2018 meeting and the Arctic Observing Summit. And then also we've talked about um, the Arctic Science Ministerial coming up at the end of the year, how to ensure that the results of these efforts are, are uh, visible there. Um, the next Arctic Data Committee meeting that's more relevant to this community is being hosted by the WMO. We're just trying to nail down the dates. It will likely be in mid to late uh, November in, uh, in Geneva. Uh, one question here for this community as well, the IARPIC group is, you know, do we need to start doing this a bit more locally in the US? And, uh, and how will we do that? Perhaps through IARPIC or, or other initiatives. Uh, one thing I think we learned is that, you know, to get our house in order internationally, it also really helps if national organizations are, are bringing things together. Um, so working towards persistent collaboration was really a highlight um, towards the end as well. So trying to take what has been happening just sort of in a somewhat ad hoc way, you know, coming out of the community into something that's more formalized. So that concludes the update on the Polar Data Planning Summit. And I would open it up to uh, anyone for questions or others who were there, if you have comments you would like to make. Okay. Not even one question. <laughs> okay. Well, um, if you do have any questions or comments, feel free if they come to you uh, in the second half, we can uh, we can come back to it. Uh, just a quick comment. Um, it was a great meeting. Thank you, Peter, and everyone. Yeah, the, a large group of people involved, and uh, I'm pleased that you found it. 
found it helpful. Um, and I think, you know, there are some things that we'd already sort of talked about, but what I did feel was a bit different from this meeting was the, the hands-on and a lot of people commented on that afterwards. So um, the other the other part of it, just a moment, sorry, Jota, great. Um, the other part of it, it was that it was really collaborative and international. So it wasn't just one group that was sort of leading or one country, et cetera. We had participation from a, a wide variety of different actors. So I think that was also quite helpful. Sorry, Jota. I was gonna ask uh, if there was discussions around um, not just observations, but modeling outputs as well, both uh, numerical simulations, <coughs> both in terms of weather and our climate prediction, climate, you know, long range climate predictions, you know, you know, which you have to talk about if you're going to talk about impacts and things. Was that, <clears throat> did that play into it all? Accessibility to the large, um, you know, the volumes of data on the, on the <coughs> like AMIP and what have you. Mm -hmm. so that did come up. Um, Sandy Starkweather actually gave us a really great presentation on day one that really touched well on that and that idea of the whole sort of life cycle of the data right through to modeling and beyond. Um, so it came up, we did a lot of the technical discussion I don't think was focused, although I, I'm still going through all of those notes or many pages of notes. Um, but that's where I think when we talked about the, you know, discovery being quite key to start that would also need to include not just data, but other types of products or, or higher level sort of mediated or synthesized uh, data. So it certainly was part of the conversation. I believe Tanil talked about that as well, and, and we'll have a little bit from Tanil in the next session, section of this, uh, this meeting on that as well under things like the year of polar prediction and ISOA. So that's a great point. Peter, can I just add two cents on that? Sure. So I, I think one of the, the things that from the standpoint of US Arctic Observing Network and international activities that we're trying to better wrap our heads around is that full value tree from the observing system all the way through the stakeholder and how we can maybe create some more structured descriptions or, or a more structured sort of framework approach to help us understand how to best exploit the value of observations that then flow into models that then flow into higher order model outputs and and i and i think one of the things that i really hope to partner well with with peter in this community on um, in the future is is having that um that sense of of the data uh management um assets that are are, are sort of uh, striped across that whole process, or we kept saying interleaved, that those two descriptions really need to, mm -hmm. to ride together um, with each other. So um, thanks for the, the comment, and, and it's something that we're really going to be keeping our eye on. Great. Thanks, Sandy, for that. And that's actually uh, yeah, a big omission on my part. The, the interleaving part was a big part of the discussion um, on both, both tracks, actually. Great, any other comments or questions? Okay. okay, well that brings us almost exactly to halfway. So I'm gonna start the next section uh, with a bit of an overview um, and I'll just start sharing my screen here again. And then I'm going to be asking for a few people who are on the line to unmute themselves and, and uh, contribute to this. Uh, this part that is about the upcoming um, Arctic Observing Summit, or Arctic Observing Summit, which is happening in Davos in, uh, as part of Polar 2018. You should be able to see my screen now. Um, and in that, there'll be a number of different um, papers that, that we will be uh, using as part of our discussion at that meeting. Uh, and that relate to many of the different issues that we've, we've just sort of seen from this planning summit as well. And just let me get my slide deck going here. Um, just before I get into that, for those of you who are either going to um, Polar 2018 or who are not and are just interested in what might be happening there, uh, I've just put together a few uh, points here about some of the data related activities going on there. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the Standing Committee on Antarctic Data Management as well as the Southern Ocean Observing System Data um, Team will be meeting from the 15th to the 17th. 
and then the 16th we'll have this joint meeting so um, this uh, mirrors what happened in uh, Montreal last September where those three groups got together and, and held joint meetings so in that case we're going to be looking at, at sort of um, things of, of interest uh, common interest which of course uh, includes data discovery data interoperability standards and so on um, so we're looking forward to another productive day uh, there in uh, Davos before the actual Arctic Science Summit Week and STAR conferences start. Uh, the evening of the 22nd, a group of us put together um, sort of a social event or it's, it's like a data managers meet, meet you know, anybody else who, who's not a data manager uh, and there'll be some refreshments and so on. And that's the, um, if I am correct, the evening of Friday the 22nd. We'll be encouraging people to come out to that. Um, Tuesday the 19th, our friends at the GeoCold Regions Initiative, or GeoCree, GeoCry, depending on how you pronounce it, will be having a side meeting that I'll be part of from 12.30 to 2 p.m. Um, in uh, Room A, Wishhorn. And uh, they'll be talking about a number of different uh, cold regions uh, initiatives or topics, uh, including data. Uh, there are a number of different sessions, so EN5 uh, that I'm uh, partly convening, Big Data, Small Data, Your Data, What Does Good Data Management Mean to You, uh, SH8, which is looking a little bit more, it's in the social science component or a social science track, which is data science for polar environments, um, discovery, rescue, and mining. So all of this, of course, is on the polar2018.org website, so if you're interested in, in the actual abstracts and so on, you can go there and find them. Uh, there's another that's focused on the uh, Earth observation uh, system, solutions for data collection, compilation, and dissemination. So a number of conveners there, including our friends at the uh, Intaros uh, project coming out of Europe. And then another on remote sensing of polar regions. So um, there are likely others. I don't know that I fully scoured the entire site, but those are some of the key ones that I'm aware of. And if you find any others, it'd be great if you could just post that to the um, to the meeting uh, site related to this meeting, and that would be great. We can add it to our list for people who are, are going. So at the end of Polar 2018 is the Arctic Observing Summit, and so this will be, I believe, the fourth Arctic Observing Summit, and the three others starting in uh, 2013 in Vancouver. There have been two since then. So this particular observing summit is focused on the business case for an Arctic observing system. And that includes many different topics, um, and data is one of those topics that, as we, you know, Sandy mentioned, that we're feeling more and more is interleaved with a whole bunch of, of the, uh, all of the other topics as well. Um, the AOS is broken into themes, so there's um, a general theme which is looking at, at utilizing the observing system, and then under that there's a sub-theme which is implementing and optimizing a pan-arctic observing system. And within that, there are a number of working groups. So working group four is focused on data management. Uh, so Oystein Godoy and I are um, co-chairing that, and Oystein is on, and he'll be um, speaking to a couple of the papers in a few minutes. Um, what we have done as co-chairs of that group is we've received a number of different um, statements, uh, 1,500 words and less, about various topics. And so we're just going to be quickly going through um, each of those statements to give you a sense of what they are. And then also, although formally the, the call for statements is closed, if you are interested in providing us with statement that you feel would be useful, I think we could informally accept that and integrate it or synthesize it into our, into our discussion. Um, so the way we've organized the papers, um, we're sort of looking at it both from geographic scale and also from our subject matter sort of uh, continuum. And so Paul Berkman, who is online with this, is going to speak for a couple of minutes about the paper that he submitted that's looking at the, um, the new um, science cooperation agreement um, under the Arctic Council and how that has implications for data, data management, data sharing, and so on. I'll be presenting a paper that essentially provide sort of an overarching view of the data coordination or collaboration initiatives, including the results of the Polar Data Planning Summit last week. Um, Tanil Utah, uh, who is online, is going to um, hopefully can just say a couple of words, and I just added a couple of slides from her deck last week on an initiative that's happening um, in a global scale initiative, but focused on particular 
uh, domain um, in, in atmospheric domain. Similarly, with the stranded owl paper, um, they're focusing on an international project that's particularly looking at permafrost. Uh, and then we have one by Pirazzini et al. Um, from the uh, Intaros project, where they're sort of more of a regional project, but they're looking at you know, global scale issues and, and many different issues across the board. And then uh, Mary Beth Murray, who unfortunately couldn't make it today, uh, she'll be providing a paper, is providing a paper on the uh, Canadian initiative that is focusing at the national level, sort of down the geographic scale, but um, looking at many, many different topics and themes. So um, with that, Paul, I'm wondering if you could just take a few minutes to just um, speak about the uh, paper that you're presenting at AOS or have submitted. And please remember to unmute yourself. Hi, Peter. Hello, everybody. Um, the Arctic Science Agreement, um, Agreement on Enhancing International Arctic Scientific Cooperation was signed on the 11th of May, 2017 and came into force, uh, I think it was on the 23rd of May this year. Um, so it's now an active agreement signed by the foreign ministers of all of the Arctic states. Uh, the, there was a paper in science that I uh, published with uh, International Arctic Science Committee and uh, University of the Arctic um, in November um, on the 3rd that goes over the Arctic Science Agreement and its implementation. And so in effect, there is an agreement that was constructed by the diplomatic community that relates specifically to science. And part of the uh, challenge will be the implementation of that agreement. And it's clear to implement the agreement, it must involve the scientific community. And so uh, that's a question um, that is uh, in play as to how the scientific community can best contribute to the implementation of the Arctic Science Agreement. Um, there are discussions that are in, in uh, ongoing with uh, IASC, uh, with uh, IASA, the International Arctic Social Science Association, and UARTIC to effectively serve as a bridge uh, between the scientific community and the diplomatic community. And there are also discussions ongoing within the United States, within the U.S. Um, Arctic Re with the Arctic Research Commission um, regarding this as well. In a general sense, uh, the role of data is fundamental to the implementation of the Arctic uh, Science Agreement. Um, in the collection of the data in the observing systems, as well as the analysis and ultimately um, the use of the data. And I note in the earlier comments you made, Peter, that the why uh, should be leading the questions about what and how and et cetera. And in effect, uh, the challenge that is faced, not just in a data context, but in a context of sustainable development as an overriding common Arctic issue is relates to informed decisions. And the informed decisions uh, are, are generally of two flavors. Um, one flavor relates to governance mechanisms, um, relates to agreements um, such as the polar code um, or marine pollution preparedness and response, search and rescue. Um, but it also relates to built infrastructure um, infrastructure that requires both technology and capitalization and these relate to goods and services and in effect to achieve sustainable solutions requires a, a coupling between the types of decisions that would be involved with uh, governance mechanisms and built infrastructure the data component fits in to all of these discussions in a sense uh, in the science paper, there was introduced a, a process that contributes to informed decision making. And an informed decision is defined as a across a continuum of urgencies. So uh, an analogy would be when you're driving down the road in your car, um, you need to be aware of the cars that are around you and their movements, and you need to be aware of the traffic ahead of you. Um, simultaneously and so in order for you to drive safely down the road and it, the analogy applies to virtually every type of decision making system that exists in our world and so the arctic was used as a as an illustration uh, for that 
informed decision-making process in that paper in Science in, in November. In effect, there are steps uh, that lead to an informed decision. The first are questions. The questions evoke um, uh, among a, a, uh, an inclusive international interdisciplinary set of stakeholders, a set of methodologies um, that would be necessary to answer those questions. And those methodologies to be inclusive uh, range across the natural sciences and social sciences as well as indigenous knowledge, uh, recognizing that all of these uh, activities effectively uh, generate insights about patterns and trends and those patterns and trends become the basis for decisions. So the data that's collected uh, becomes is used to answer those questions. However, data itself is not evidence. Evidence is involved is an integration of different questions in the context of the governance mechanisms and the institutions that are involved with making the decisions. And so the data effectively uh, underlies the evidence, but the evidence itself isn't the answer for the decision. The evidence effectively only compels the decision makers to act, doesn't necessarily define how they should act or what types of solutions are, are reasonable. And that relates to the development of options. And options in this sense are different than recommendations. Options are tendered without advocacy. They can be used or ignored explicitly by the decision makers. They are not, uh, in, they are not recommendations that evolve agendas recognizing that agendas introduce political dynamics. And if the sole objective of introducing options is to contribute to informed decisions. And so in this process, the, the role of data is fundamental to understand the types of evidence that would be generated, the types of options that would be feasible, and ultimately to generate informed decisions. And so going to your question, Peter, earlier about what the why is, I would introduce as an option, which can be used or ignored, that the, op the ultimately, ultimate apex goal of all of our activities is to contribute to informed decisions. And we recognize that with more sophisticated questions, with, with better observing systems, with better data collection techniques and analysis connect techniques and models, that the ability to inform decisions improves. And so the notion of an informed decision itself is dynamic. Um, okay, thank you, Paul. I'm going to have to ask you to stop there. We just have a number of others to go through and uh, we're at time. I, so I, Paul is going to be leading us in this discussion, this part of the discussion, uh, hopefully in person in, in Davos at the AOS. Um, and then this will be fitting in, I think, right at the, the sort of top of the, the discussion um, in the synthesis papers and things that we create for AOS. So, great. Um, I won't say too much. I think I said uh, quite a bit about um, the topic of the, the paper that I'm going to be submitting uh, with a number of co-authors. So we'll just um, be summarizing what's happened very recently as well as what's happened in the past as well with respect to our overall collaboration and coordination um, for the, the data community. Um, uh, Oystein, could I ask you just to say a few yeah. words about um, the Intaros paper? Yeah, sure. I don't know how familiar you are with Intaros, but uh, first some a quick background, that's not part of the paper, but Intaros is the major effort from the European Union on addressing the, uh, the Arctic Observing Network and a sustainable Arctic Observing Network. So this paper covers an uh, analysis that has been initiated by the or survey and an analysis uh, initiated by Intados where they tried to find out what are the existing uh, observation networks uh, or observations in the Arctic what are the gaps in time and space how are data available etc so the initial uh, also the initial survey was only done among the partners of Intados but they are now moving into the a uh, broader scope inviting other uh, uh, actors also to uh, contribute to the uh, to the survey so this is sort of an ongoing work that hopefully will give us a better overview of what exists of observations where they are located how they can be accessed and also if there are gaps in time and space for them i think that's a brief description of it 
Great. And then I will also ask you just for flow to also just give a quick overview of the uh, GTNP um, paper by Strand et al. Yeah, so this is uh, basically, uh, as the title says, it's about collecting permafrost information and uh, integrating it into the Panarctic observing system. So it's very focused on what ex is the current content of the GTNP, how they are now moving into uh, also gridded data from, uh, for example, the, uh, the ESA project on uh, satellite imagery. Uh, it's less focusing on the technical level of integration into an uh, observing system uh, through uh, data management, but it's focusing on the existing content and the information content in particular for the uh, uh, of, of GTNP. Great, thank you. Um, Tanil, if you're open to just saying a few words, I just put in a couple of slides on, uh, on your ISOA initiative related to YOP. Um, but maybe if you're okay with it, you can you can introduce uh, that paper. Um, sure. Um, I feel like I'm kind of coming from a different approach here. <clears throat> we had this year of polar prediction, which they are putting together these considerable data sets over certain super sites in the Arctic um, with modeling output. And one of the intents is to be comparing that to the um, observatory, the data that's collected at observatories. And one of the issues that we've noticed is that this is going to be involving data that's created by many, many different institutions, many, many different sensors, many, many different data processing um, processes. And so we're actually trying to come up with a merged data file for each observatory for each year of polar prediction um, special observing period. And I'm very interested in working with this group at AOS because I feel like we're kind of going through this procedure because we have found that the portals and the data discovery and data extraction tools we don't think would be sufficient for us to be able to create these files. And creating these files is going to be a tremendous amount of work. And um, I'm looking forward to discussing this um, with the other groups. In, um, just in connection to the two previous um, presentations, we will not just have atmospheric data, we will also have permafrost and surface data um, because most of these observatories have those observations as well and we, can, we consider that part of the total system. And then also with regard to the Intaros presentation, I have suggested to Intaros that ISOA may be considered um, already a uh, foundation for the atmospheric component of Intaros. And so we're interested in discussing that further at AOS as well. Great, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to as well as to convening this group because I think we have a really good mix of the types of things Paul was talking about right from the very top, right down into the very specific aspects of, of making data work together. And what Siri Jota brought up earlier as well as taking it from data into modeling and, and beyond, so great. And I will just wrap up this section um, with uh, speaking on Mary Best's behalf. Um, she will be um, talking about or has submitted a paper about the new Canadian Consortium for Arctic Data Interoperability. So this is a, a multi-partner initiative. I think there are about nine different universities involved, um, Polar Knowledge Canada, Natural Resources Canada, um, several indigenous organizations and others who have all come together and are seeking funding and, and doing some good work, um, making some positive um, progress on that to try and, and work together in Canada to bring together various systems, but not just talking again about the technology, but also thinking about standards, about organizational structure, governance, all of those types of things. Um, so that is a very national uh, focus, nationally focused project, but I think what's coming out of that will have um, be a great contribution to the international conversations and, and systems, um, as well as um, going right down into the local. So they'll be, you know, working with a number of groups, you know, right on the ground, whether that be scientists or whether it be indigenous communities and so on. Um, so in that case, um, they have both a technical um, stream uh, that's looking at those tools, and then they're seeking funding as well uh, to look at a lot of the social science questions and uh, particularly around indigenous knowledge. So 
Um, we'll have great conversations there about how all of that interconnects. And with that, um, I will end the formal presentation component. And it's gone a little long, but I hope that at least this provided you with some interesting information. And we have about seven minutes or so left for any questions and, uh, and dialogue that we want to have. So I will open up the floor for questions or comments. And I will stop sharing my screen and get back to being able to see those of you who have video. Hi, this is Bill Manley. I just want to mention that in the chat, I put a couple of links about the Antaros uh, survey of observing systems and a related mapping application. Great. And yeah, they have a number of different initiatives going on under that, that project. Um, and they're also going to be putting together a white paper. They are putting together a white paper now that was presented at the meeting last week that's uh, also looking at, at data and particularly the data infrastructure center that's part of their initiative, but, but others as well. So we've agreed as a global community to assist in that process um, because I think it would benefit, benefit all of us for sure. So. Okay. Um, does anyone have any thoughts or suggestions on, in terms of the Arctic Observing Summit, whether you're going or not, uh, pardon me, what you would like to see coming out of that? Um, it, is, it is a summit and it does have things like recommendations, et cetera. Are there certain things that you would like to prioritize? Are there other types of outputs that you think would be useful for our community or, or um, how might you contribute to some of them? Uh, Peter, this is Paul. Um, just as a, if you are going to make recommendations, the question is who the recommendations are being made to other than ourselves and funding agencies. And if the focus is on sustainability and business practices, is there a consideration of other communities that would be receptive to these recommendations? That's an excellent point, Paul. And I think you bring up a couple um, to mind. Uh, earlier today, I was on a call with, with the coordinating um, committee for AOS, and of course, the ministerial came out as, as part of that discussion, as one uh, outlet, if you will, or one target. Um, but I also think you, you point out the importance of going to communities we may not often work with, like um, industry and, and others, because they are part of the system, but they're often not sitting at the table. Okay. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay. Well, if you do have any, please feel free to drop a line on the IARPIC website, um, send an email, or however you want to provide input. Um, can I get a sense, are beyond uh, Paul and Tennille and Oystein, who I know will be there, uh, is there anyone else online who will be at the Arctic Observing Summit? Uh, Sandy, I guess, you will be there as well. Okay, Siri Joda, you're going to be there? Okay. And, um, uh, representing our map at AOB is Naomi Witte with okay. Non Polar Services. Okay, great. I'm just trying to get a sense because the conveners are asking us uh, sort of who might be engaging in uh, in this theme. And I know some of you may want to skip from theme to theme, but um, it'd be great if you could at least spend part of your time uh, with the uh, with the data theme. Okay, well, we're coming up on our time. And so I'll leave it there. Uh, just a note that this uh, sub team will not be meeting in June because it overlaps directly with the uh, Polar 2018. Uh, July and August are a bit of a question mark at the moment. Uh, generally, we found it very difficult to convene a meeting on those months due to vacation, field work, et cetera. However, if you watch the uh, your, your inbox, uh, we will go out and see if there's uh, interest in maybe moving forward on particular topics and we can put something together. So Mark and I will come back to you and if you do have particular topics that you would like to address, uh, please let us know and we can try and organize uh, some time to talk about it. 
Okay. Thanks, Peter. Great. Well, thank you all for your time. And Paul, see you next week. Bye. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Take care. Right